Susan Foster is the Vice President and Director of Policy, Research, and Analysis at the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University. She is nationally known for her analysis on the impact and costs of substance abuse in America. Ms. Foster, can you share with us the findings of your research in regard to the gap between science and practice as it pertains to addiction medicine? In uh, this summer, uh, Casa Columbia released a five-year study uh, looking at addiction medicine. The title was Addiction Medicine, Closing the Gap Between Science and Practice. The purpose of this study was to understand what we know about the science of addiction and then to look at what the relationship is between that and what we're actually doing to prevent and treat it. So we looked at the science, we did surveys, we did an analysis of many na national data sets, um, and we also talked to a lot of people who are engaged in this work. And so what we did was to come up with a pretty encyclopedic look at the landscape of addiction science and the workforce available to prevent and treat it, the disconnects, and came up with a set of recommendations about what we need to do to close this gap between science and practice. What would be your recommendation for physicians to improve their level of care? Physicians have largely been asleep at the switch when it comes to addiction. There is a huge need for physicians to educate themselves about the nature of addiction, how to screen for it, how to intervene, how to treat it, how to manage the disease, and how to refer for specialty care as they do for any other health condition. What can family members and other concerned parties do to better assist their loved ones struggling with addiction? Casa Columbia has done a lot of research looking at the role of families in this disease. Parents, for example, are the most significant influence when a child is growing up uh, in whether or not they will turn to the use of these substances. The fact is that most parents or members of the community at large are not well educated about the nature of addiction and the dangers of risky use and the importance of keeping their kids from engaging with these substances while the brain is still developing. So the first thing for parents to do and family members is to just get better educated. It's hard, but they need to, and they need to be aggressive when they go into their health care providers to make sure that the health care provider is screening for these problems and has some effective knowledge of what to do uh, if it should occur. How can families best evaluate physicians' care over patients suffering from addiction? There, there is a huge challenge to parents today who are trying to make sure they get effective care as it relates to both prevention or treatment, they have no assurance when they walk into a doctor's office that their doctor knows anything about this problem. So we have to look at this from two sides. One is to find ways to quickly improve the education, training, and continuing education for physicians across the board about addiction, risky use, and what to do about it. But also, we need to inform parents that this is a public health problem and a medical problem, and that they need to, re to require their doctors to get information for them. One of the things we're trying to do at Casa Columbia is to develop a patient guide. So we would give parents information about what questions to ask their doctors, what they should look for if they're needing treatment, what's the difference between risky use or addiction, just basic information that will help them navigate the health system when it comes to these issues. Ms. Foster, your research study concluded that only one out of 10 persons dealing with addiction receive help. Could you elaborate on that finding? Only about one in 10 people with addiction just involving alcohol and other drugs gets any form of treatment. That doesn't even include treatment for nicotine addiction. We don't as a country even know how many people get treatment for that. But if you think that it's one in 10 get treatment for alcohol and other drugs, compared to 70 to 80% of people with other conditions like cancer, diabetes, or heart disease actually get some kind of care. That's a dramatic disconnect. And it's a function of several things. One is that addiction historically for decades has been marginalized as a social problem rather than treating as a medical condition. Even though the AMA in the 50s recognized addiction involving alcohol as a disease. So we, we know this, this huge disconnect exists. What can be done to bring about a national standard for addiction treatment? 
Yeah, the, the tragic reality is that there are no national standards for addiction treatment in this country. What passes for addiction treatment varies by state and by who pays the bill. There are few restrictions on who can hang out a shingle and say, I'm going to provide addiction care. Largely, addiction is disconnected from mainstream medical care, so it's not even acknowledged through many regulators as medical care. So what we have to do is move the way we address this problem into medical practice. We need to license addiction treatment providers as healthcare facilities. We need to develop core clinical competencies for providers that are based on scientific evidence. And we have to assure accreditation of facilities and programs as healthcare providers and as a providing effective evidence-based care. Can you explain how treating addiction will help improve healthcare costs? Right now, we are, we as a society, are paying at the back end because of our failure to prevent and treat addiction. We're paying, of every dollar federal and state governments spend on this program, if you just look at government spending, it's about $467 billion every year. Of every dollar federal and state governments spend, only two cents goes to prevention and treatment, and 96 cents goes to clean up after the problem. With effective investments in prevention and treatment, we know we can change that equation. We can reduce those back end consequences. And every study we've looked at showed that evidence-based therapies are cost effective. They do give a return greater than the investment, even though that's not a criteria for any other health condition we're treating in this country. We know for addiction that it is cost effective to provide care. Ms. Foster, please give us a sense of why you think prevention is important. The best way to approach the problem of risky use and addiction is clearly just to prevent it. If we can prevent the disease from occurring, we reduce this incalculable human suffering and huge taxpayer bill at the back end. But to prevent it, we have to understand the disease. We have to understand that there's a difference between the disease of addiction and risky use of substances that doesn't meet medical criteria. Not everybody who's a risky user is going to become addicted, but there's still going to be a lot of health and social consequences that accrue. The most important thing we can do is to understand that in most cases addiction is a developmental disorder. It starts with substance use in childhood and t the teen years when the brain is still developing and more sensitive to the negative impact of these substances. So it's very, very important to delay or prevent use of these substances as long as possible.